Judge Clarence Thomas is an old, dear, dear friend of mine, and he's very upset tonight about this article that's in ProPublica. So, as a personal hospitality to my friend Clarence Thomas, I offered him some time on my show, because that's what dear, dear friends do as a personal hospitality. And I began to talk to him, and he is spitting angry about this article in ProPublica. And I said, Clarence, Clarence, I am your friend. And as a personal hospitality, I don't believe you should come on the show to set the record straight. Instead, write something out and as a personal hospitality, because that's what dear, dear friends do, I will read your statement on the show because I have a feeling that you'll go off script and say things that you'll regret. So as a personal hospitality to my dear, dear friends, Clarence and Ginny Thomas, I would now like to read a, a message, a statement from Judge Clarence Thomas in response to this article that is in ProPublica. So this is a statement from Judge Clarence Thomas. It reads, Harlan Crow has been one of my dearest friends for as long as I can remember. Those who think Harlan only likes me because of the legal favors I could perform simply don't know Harlan Crow. Up until recently, Harlan didn't even know what I did for a living. He thought Supreme Court Justice was my first name and Clarence Thomas was my last. Harlan likes me and I like him. That's all there is to it. He's the yin to my yang. We both enjoy expensive gifts. I receiving them, he giving them. And they weren't even gifts. I, Clarence Thomas, would never accept a gift. These were personal hospitalities. Am I supposed to disclose every personal hospitality extended to me by a friend? My neighbor, Larry, gave me his old chainsaw last year. Should I disclose that? The waitress at the Olive Garden didn't charge us for a refill on my soda. Should I disclose that? Harlan Crow flies me on his private jet to an all-expense-paid vacation at his resort in the Adirondacks, where he gets me talking about the inner workings of the court so he can invest accordingly. I'm supposed to disclose that, too? Where does it all end? Look, I'm a public servant, and as a public servant, I totally get it. I get it. That, that sacrifices must be made for the privilege of sitting on the highest court, which is why when I took this job, I gave up repeatedly asking female underlings out on dates, no matter how often they insisted it made them uncomfortable. I also agreed to stop following female co-workers into the ladies room without consent to show off my photographic memory by describing in precise detail the Brazilian nun porn I watched the night before. I even dialed back my witticisms, foregoing my Noel Coward-like bon mots, like asking attractive female co-workers if that was a pubic hair on their Diet Coke. I gave all that up for the court. But I never agreed, nor would I, to becoming a casualty in the radical left's war on Christmas by refusing gifts. I'm sorry, did I say gifts? I meant personal hospitalities. I would never accept a gift. That would be wrong. Did I accept $500,000 in free travel each year from Harlan? Yes. And I will do so again this year because Harlan is a Christian and I have no right to interfere with any man's religious freedom to be generous. Hey, if I knew these trips were valued at $500,000 each, I'd go on the prices right. I just accepted them. It never occurred to me to say, 
This is a fantastic private resort, Harlan, and your free meals are incredible. What would it run us if Ginny and I decide to stop being your friend and instead go out of pocket? You don't ask how much a personal hospitality is worth. Read the Bible, specifically the hospitalities of the Magi. The baby Jesus in the hospitalities of the Magi, the baby Jesus accepted the gold, frankincense, and myrrh from the three wise men, but never once said, can you ballpark what all this would go for on the open market, you know, in the name of full transparency? Didn't happen. Never said it. And let's clear something up immediately. Harlan isn't giving me hospitalities because I sit on the Supreme Court. I know this guy. He'd hospitality me if I were an appellate court judge or even a municipal judge. Harlan likes judges. Some billionaires who own luxury resorts invite artists, musicians, or chefs to come visit. Harlan prefers offering judicial residencies. At his resort, his guests are encouraged to learn the joy of judging by watching me judge things like how fresh the salmon at lunch was or how cinematic that last sunset turned out to be. Because I get paid to judge, I'm always amazed at how little your run-of-the-mill weekend judge, with no hopes of ever going pro, actually knows about judging, especially when it comes to judging the difference between a French Merlot and one from the Napa Valley. I wish more people could spend time with me at these resorts just watching me judge things. They would gain a keener appreciation of how hard it is to sit on the Supreme Court. Harlan and I get along so well because we're not jealous of each other's immense talent. He's not envious of my great judging skills, and I'm not envious of his innate gift to find just the right personal hospitality to keep me coming back to his resorts. Now, some accuse me of liking Harlan simply because he's wealthy. Honestly, up until this story broke in ProPublica, I had no idea that Harlan was a billionaire. I swear, I never think about what people are worth. I figured he was a multimillionaire. Turns out he's a billionaire. Doesn't matter to me. And by the way, the hospitality giving was a two-way street. Yes, his personal hospitalities given to me were in the neighborhood of $500,000 each. But my personal hospitalities given to him were the act of showing gratitude for his personal hospitalities to me that were in the neighborhood of $500,000 each. That's what dear, dear friends do. They exchange personal hospitalities. For example, I remember waking up Christmas morning last year on his super yacht, anchored off an Indonesian archipelago. Sitting on my nightstand, I noticed a gift-wrapped mid-condition Patek Philippe watch cast in rose gold. It was a personal hospitality from Harlan Crow. Knowing that this watch was only one of two in existence, I wanted to give Harlan a personal hospitality of equal value. I thought long and hard, how do I reciprocate? And then it hit me. I would wear the new watch at dinner. I wish I could wear the look on his face that night around my wrist but I guess I'll just have to settle with the $700,000 Patek Philippe watch instead. Time now for the professors and Marianne. Professor Adnan Hussein is chairman of the religion department over at Queens University. 
in Kingston, Ontario, and he co-hosts Guerrilla History with Henry Huckamacki, who I just spoke to. He has more good. I didn't speak to him email more. He has amazingly good news. His life. He's been launched. Henry has been launched and is out there. And uh, and the Mudgeless podcast. And we'll find out who is on the Mudgeless podcast and Guerrilla History later on. And Professor Mary Ann Cummings, despite being a brilliant artist, and I mean a breathtakingly brilliant artist, is also a particle physicist and parks commissioner for Aurora, Illinois, and walks the walk, literally walks the walk, knocks on doors, and for Bernie, for Nina Turner, Rachel Ventura, John Lash, and a lot of politicos in Illinois. And you had a big, important election in Illinois this week. Tell us what happened. Let's start with Chicago. Brandon? Oh, okay. yeah, yeah. yeah, Brandon Johnson. And I I, I can't think of a, a, a recent election that is more starkly about the... Um, the, the establishment Democratic Party versus the uh, what we would broadly call the Bernie wing of the Democratic Party um, than Chicago. The, and, you know, um, to first order, we've never had a Republican mayor. The Republicans don't exist in Chicago. I mean, and you don't need Republicans when you have people like Rahm Emanuel <laughs> or Lori Lightfoot, for that matter, or the Dailies. I mean, I remember like uh, Bill Daly Jr., Richie Daly Jr. threw a big birthday bash in 2006 for George W. Bush when he came to town. It was really pretty disgusting. So what is who is Brandon and do we like him? Uh, I think we do. He was uh, he he was a Bernie Sanders supporter. Bernie Sanders had a rally in town about a week uh, the. Yes, about a week ago, it was Friday before the election. And it was kind of reminiscent of the old Bernie energy and he filled a basketball arena and uh, Bernie came out in full-throated uh, support of Brandon Johnson. Now, um, uh, basically Brandon Johnson has been vilified by even many parts of the Democratic Party because he up until he was actively campaigning, when he played it down a little to be for positive things, but he was been pretty much never back down, defund the police. And he was always willing to explain what that meant. Wow. You know. Um, and he I won? Said, oh, he won decisively. And we had Paul Vall Vallis, who was like the Wall Street candidate. Paul Vallis right. was a big proponent of let's, public school privatization. Let's put it this right. way. He was a big proponent of Arne Duncan, who became Barack Obama's uh, education secretary. But he had been um, in the he, he had been in charge of the public school system and really amped up the charter school program. Uh, charter schools are in principle a non-for-profit enterprise, but we all know that they're just basically a front for a lot of very for-profit, you know, Wall Street-based mm -hmm. enterprises. It is basically, you know, they they uh, market it as school choice, but, you know, it's, it's the schools choosing the students, not the students choosing right. the schools, particularly right. if you're in a poor neighborhood. And Rahm right. Emanuel was infamous for closing down 50 public schools. Um, and even if they're not functioning like you would like, they're more than just the educational center of the area. They're often like the social, they, they would be the one stabilizing influence in a neighborhood right. for kids who have no other resources. And right. uh, so anyway, that was all. So you're, are, so are you, are you happy with the results? In I'm happy with the results in Chicago. I, I think 
some of the hardcore Bernie people, uh, we always taper our enthusiasm for a win with, okay, a reminder that this is just square zero. I mean, now begins the hard work. Mm -hmm. You have to go after the guy you kind of like and, you know, go after him with all the zeal you went after Republicans or corporate Democrats, even though he's your guy, because the uh, the pressures that would produce a Richard Daly or a Rahm Emanuel or Paul Vallis are still very much in place. But I think it was a bit of a shock because they thought they had him. They thought they nailed him on his adamant defund the police. And in fact, um, there was a big there was a big uh, much ado made about a statement from a former police chief saying that he personally knew of a thousand police officers who would just quit their jobs. If, right. And everybody on Twitter was going, is that a promise? Right. <laughs> Can you get that down in writing? Because, you know, again, uh, I think I mentioned that the problem with these police departments is that, you know, from the beginning of the middle of the Bush years, all through the Obama years, police departments have been increasingly militarized. Right after the Black Lives Matter protest uh, happened in, in Aurora, the next day, because there was rioting afterwards, having nothing to do with the Black Lives Matter protest, but... God knows who these people were who came in and set half of the downtown on fire. I mean, 10 military vehicles were just rolling down Broadway. Right. Well, 25. Like what? I said, a no knock, a no knock warrant on Marianne's house. Is that what you feel this is necessary for? I mean, it's crazy. The amount of money spent, you know, on, on maintaining this hardware. And we're not, people aren't safer. I mean, it's not like the crime rate has gone down. What has gone up is uh, more more instances of police brutality. Right. I mean, for a generation now, they have been trying to get a hold of uh, police and, and try to reform police departments, try to make them more. I mean, uh, try to make them more sensitive to racial issues and try to be more community policing rather than militaristic. But the bottom line is the whole culture of these police departments are like occupying armies right. rather than public servants. But it is it is not to be overly optimistic, mm-hmm. but, you know, I'll take any good news I can. There is. Yes. They are having problems filling these slots. A lot of people don't want to be cops anymore. Unfortunately, cops are turning into the Republican Party where all the good people head for the exits and the only ones left are Lauren Boebert and Marjorie Taylor Greene. Let me ask uh, let me ask uh, Professor Adnan Hussein a question. Happy Ramadan. Thanks so much. Why you are the chairman of the religion department at Queens University? Uh in Kingston, Ontario, I think you described yourself as a petty tyrant once. <laughs> Absolutely. <Very petty. laughs> why is Ramadan Passover? Why do Ramadan Passover and Good Friday all fall around the same time? What, are, what do all three have in common? Well, It's a bit of a coincidence. I mean, it's not a coincidence that Passover and Easter uh, are in the same season, obviously. Um, As we know from the gospel accounts, uh, Jesus celebrated Passover. Um, The Last Supper was a Passover Seder. And of course, um, his crucifixion, scourging, his capture by the Romans, scourging, crucifixion, entombment, and resurrection, all uh, described in the Gospels, takes place soon thereafter. So uh, the uh, coincidence of those in the same season is, of course, normal, but there are different calculations for exactly when Easter is to be celebrated, and there are differences among different Christian denominations, so the Orthodox will be having it in a subsequent week. Um, But uh, you know, they're roughly going to be in the same season. It just so happens that they're really happening at exactly the same time. Ramadan is a whole month in a lunar calendar, the Muslim religious calendar, the so-called Hijri calendar, named for the uh, migration of Muhammad 
from Mecca to Medina that begins sort of Muslim history in a way. That's when they date it. Um, is is a lunar calendar, which means that the lunar year is shorter by about 10 to 12 days than a solar year. And as a result, every year, Ramadan moves 10 to 12 days earlier. And after about 30 years or so, it goes through the whole year. So it just so happens that right now, it's been in this sort of spring season, and it's overlapping with the other two monotheistic uh, religions of the Near East. Um, and so we have this uh, period where uh, you have Ramadan, Passover, and Easter all taking place at the same time. Right. So I wish everybody happy yes. Passover, happy Good Friday. And what are you, what's your specialty? My specialty? For eating. Oh, for eating. Oh, um, I'm trying to be really good about um, eating light meals rather than kind of heavy th things. So not a lot of meat, uh, trying to avoid red meat. Um but and uh, just eat sort of chicken or you know fish or just go with beans and vegetables so last night i actually invited a lot of people mostly graduate students and other students international students who don't have family in the area for an iftar meal that is the breaking of the fast in the evening meal and i made my specialty which is fasulia which is a green bean a kind of olive oil drenched uh, green bean mm. uh, dish. And mm. it's, it's actually, I really love it. It's really good. So here's, I'd like to talk about Yemen, which is probably our most important story tonight. We had some good news. I, Professor Marianne, I'm glad to hear about Brandon in Chicago. That, that cheers me up. So we'll talk about Yemen. And I want to talk about uh, Iran and Saudi Arabia. I know Professor Marianne has some comments about that and the the Chinese charm offensive. Uh, but I want to plug Rahima so people can donate. And we also have questions from our virtual studio audience. Uh, I find it kind of thrilling on a Friday night there. It's a much more active crowd than than we had during the weekdays. So let me throw this at Professor Marianne. This is from Brian. He's a political psychology grad. He's, uh, he's studying political psychology, political psychology, my God, at grad school. I didn't know there was such a thing. Um, wow. And uh, this is for Professor Marianne. She's a particle physicist. We'll get Professor Hussein's answer to this. What is her take on the increasing number of Americans who are flat earthers? It's alarming. Thanks so much. Uh, did I did I see somewhere in the chat that seven percent that it's up to seven? Is it true? You know. Are they really flat earthers or are they just trying to own the libs? That's not his question. That's mine. No, I but, you know, that was my first reaction, because I know that there are a lot of very tongue in cheek sites about this. You know, my personal preference would be for the flying spaghetti monster theory of everything. That's, what is what is that? Oh, that's the religion that explains everything. <laughs> <laughs> All about the flying spaghetti monster and Every scintilla and strand from DNA to string theory and physics, you know, is reflecting his noodly goodness. <laughs> Actually, those guys are kind of hilarious. But, um, but, but so, flat you know, Earth, f tell me but, what is what do they believe that you can fall have, off the face of the Earth? I have no idea. I, th I think this is as somebody said it might be a psyop. I think that there are just a lot of tongue in cheek websites but there might there might be an aspect of making the libs think you're serious and then you know kind of smacking them around um i, I, I don't new know contrarianism but, yes know. exactly right just to see yeah we should form the round earth society uh professor hussein your 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 thoughts i i took your crusade class and maps you, you work so great with maps. I've always thought you should do like have a YouTube channel just pointing at maps and just explaining ma maps. 
Uh, That's a great idea. It's fun to look at maps and to yeah. just look at the geography and then add the history. So you yeah. give it a temporal dimension to the You've station. done that. I mean, you're great at it. What, what, what do you make of the, the flat well, Earth? I don't know. This is interesting. Um, you know, it's kind of like a lot of trends where the medieval is back you know, um, in a lot of realms of culture, politics. Uh, and, uh, you know, when you look at medieval Mapa Mundi. What is that? That is maps of the world, Mapa Mundi. So maps of the world, uh, especially if they're detailed, like the Hereford map or the Ebstorfer map, uh, you find that they have on the antipodes, that is at the very edge of the earth, strange phenomena, like the normal rules of uh, biology, such as uh, people understood them, don't seem to apply. And you have monopods and uh, you know, people with one life, everything that you find in Gulliver's travels, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you've, that's drawing upon this rich tradition, geographical and ethnographic lore in medieval legend um that people you know you have dog-headed people you have you know people with one big eye in their in their in their head um uh, and so on and so there's this kind of idea that you're, the, you're that, describing a trump rally yeah basically you know it's like at the limits <laughs> of your knowledge you get these crazy people <laughs> yeah so i think maybe you know it's 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 a function of of um you know, this revival of medievalism in some ways. But I actually, I think the real reason is what uh, Professor Marianne was mentioning. Well, right Professor now. Marianne is a particle physicist. Explain to me why we have this new telescope that is looking at the Big Bang. Uh, why are there no planets that are flat? In, in terms of physics, why is it impossible for for planets to only be round in three three minutes or less. Well, I mean, what are the uh, laws of the universe why, why that dictate? Are, well, why is water vapor droplets always round as long as they're liquid? I think it, you know what it has to do with it has to do with surface tension and the basically equalizing all the tensions, all, all the uh, force vectors in all directions, and you get a perfect sphere. Uh, that's how everything resolves. And you get deviations from roundness when you have other forces involved, like when you have something rotating. A warp. Huh? It warps. Things warp. It warps, yeah. I mean, it, it, when you introduce angular momentum. So you have both the uh, angular momentum and in, in the experience of that is if you take a string with a ball and then you let it go and it just goes off, you know, because the string is always pulling the ball back. That was basically Newton's great observation or insight. But uh, so you have you have the angle that you have angular momentum versus surface tension and you end up getting a more pancakey sort of thing. The Earth isn't a perfect sphere. It's warped. It's a spheroid. Yeah. But yeah. now when you look at you're a particle physicist, are there molecules, quarks or when you get down to even oh, are there, is there anything that violates that law or, or do you have square shaped? Well, everything violates that law, because when you talk about particle physics, it, you it's kind of diametrically opposed to what are still Aristotelian, like ancient ideas of atomism. Like, the, you know, quantum mechanics has replaced all that with probability theory. Right. But we still, because we have classical brains, we still have to think in terms of a point rather than a probability distribution. I mean, right. it's, it's hard for me to wrap around the fact that space and time are similarly fluid. It's right. like that seemed to be the most rigid concept in the world until you got to the speed of light, which seemed to violate all the laws of physics. And then Einstein says, well, I don't give I don't care about the speed of light. It is what it is. They've measured it. Same in all rest brains. So we just have to completely re, re uh, align our ideas of space and time. Right. And if the, if the speed of light was like something we could perceive, like about 200 miles an hour, then Time dilation and, and, and length contraction would be kind of intuitive to us, but uh, 
So let, thank you for that. Let's talk about Rahima.org. Oh. It's uh, an important, important charity that Professor Adnan Hussein's parents started. It's a, a pantry for refugees in Northern California, in the Bay Area, that his parents set up. Uh, I'll, I'll please have uh, Professor Hussein talk about it. But here in America, we create refugees, uh, especially in Afghanistan. Uh, we don't accept too many uh, that we've created. And the ones who make it to America uh, need help. Everybody needs help. Tell us about Rahima.org and how people can give. Well, thank you, David. Um, I just happened to be back in California recently, so I spent a day at the offices and warehouse of Rahima Foundation in San Jose, California, and um, it was incredibly busy. They had just had their monthly food distribution, which was a record number of people. Uh, so they provided food to 1,200 people. Wow. Uh, and many people who, you know, don't come on the weekend when the food distribution happens, but they come in on Monday when the office is open uh, to pick up rent assistance or utilities assistance checks. You know, the cost of energy has gone up. And in the Bay Area, rents have been absolutely unaffordable for, it seems, decades. But right. uh, on top of that already difficult situation, the recent economic problems, uh, everything from Google layoffs and um, the tech sector being hit to the Silicon Valley uh, banks collapse. Uh, and of course, inflation and energy costs and other food price costs that have gone up dramatically. It has sent a surge of people seeking some kind of support and assistance. And so the day I was there uh, on a Monday, uh, just it was incredibly busy. There were already people lined up at 10 a.m. when we arrived. And uh, we had to scramble to start putting together carts of, of food and um, to process uh, people who were receiving checks for uh, either rent or utilities assistance. And um, it's just become a crisis because the same factors that I just described have also meant that their donors don't have as much money to give. Mm -hmm. um, the food bank itself, Second Valley Harvest, that um, Rahima Foundation works with as a pantry, they're, they're unable to give nearly as much in-kind food, um, you know, for distribution, which means Rahima Foundation has to buy more of the food that it's trying to provide out of pocket. And of course, the cost of those uh, items has gone up so much because of inflation, as everybody has been experiencing. So it really seemed like quite a crisis point. And Rahima started with refugees initially. Afghan refugees from the first set of wars, U.S. proxy wars and Russian invasion. Um, and then uh, there were new waves of refugees coming uh, from American involvement and intervention abroad um, or failure to really stem the flow. Uh, so there were Bosnian refugees, Somali refugees that were coming. And then, of course, after the start of the global war on terrorism, uh, there were a new wave of Afghan refugees. Now with the 20th uh, anniversary pullout, uh, you know, l last year in 2021, uh, there's been yet another wave of, of Afghans, uh, but we also have had huge numbers of Iraqis, people from all over the world. And it's not just U.S. kind of wars um, and interventions and so on, but it's also just the terrible, uh, you know, uh, global economic situation right. and the desperation that so many people in the global south uh, have been experiencing. Uh, so with the pandemic, there were already huge challenges for people. And then on top of it, now the recent economic woes in the tech sector and in Silicon Valley, as I said, have just become very serious problems. So let me let me ask, let me let me try to get people to donate to Rahima.org. Let me see if I can spell it properly. R-A-H-I-M-A. And then it would be dot org. Did I get that right? Yeah, that's right. R-A-H-I-M-A. -A. What does Rahima mean? Rahima is, um, it means uh, the most compassionate. 
Um, and it's um, what every line, every chapter in the Quran, my parents are both uh, very religious and they founded this out of like their spiritual values, an ideal of service um, mm -hmm. uh, as important to them. And so they drew upon this idea of compassion and compassionate service that comes from uh, uh, opening line to every chapter of the Quran, which is in the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate, right. as one of the descriptors of God. And so that is uh, was a very important kind of emblem of um, this root value of being concerned about uh, one's neighbors and those who are suffering. So that's how they came upon uh, the name. So and so when you go to Rahim, the thing that struck me about Rahima.org is the food that gets distributed. That's right. Five dollars. Let me talk about five dollars, which nobody has. Or, you know, a your your parents are distributing. You're, they're not distributing garbage they are distributing morally i hate to use this term but morally superior food you know i'm a, a vegan sometimes i eat cheese i am morally superior to people who eat meat and beef and this food i, I don't think i'm helping rahima right now actually i think i'm pushing people away but five dollars uh, goes a long way in buying beans, rice, yogurt, healthy food, vet vegetables. It's not garbage that Raheem well, is. Well, it's absolutely true. And I, I, I tweeted about this and I also made a couple of videos. And if you go on to my Twitter at Adnan A. Hussein, H-U-S-A-I-N, you can see the two videos um, where I show some of the things that go into the food carts for each, um, you know, each person who comes uh, to collect uh, assistance from Rahima, what what they receive, and it's lentils, it's rice, it's beans, black beans, um, and um, I'll admit, okay, some organic chicken. All right, so that doesn't quite meet your sense of superiority, but at least it's organic. And yeah. where possible, they try and give organic produce and organic um, food items. And the, I think the main portion of what they provide is a very large box, actually, of mixed vegetables. And um, they had carrots and they had zucchini, sweet potato, onions, um, some leafy green vegetables, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, uh, these kinds of items. And you get a big box of that where you can cook wholesome, nutritious, healthy food. And it is really striking how in our societies, it's so much cheaper uh, in some ways uh, to get junk food uh, because of the way the industrial agriculture system seems to work. Um, and uh, they make it uh, more difficult, although if you buy produce, you can get good things cheaply. Uh, but uh, for whatever reason, it just is made more convenient and often cheaper to go for the junk food option that isn't healthy for you. And so actually Rahima has started a wellness program where they work with a healthcare provider. Wow. Uh, where when they when they have patients who have been prescribed a different diet of healthy and nutritious items, uh, but can't afford it because to eat well, for some reason, often seems to be more expensive the way things are organized, they need help. And so Rahima partners with them to provide them with uh, healthy food that's been prescribed for them as part of their treatment. And I right. think I'm really happy and proud about that development because that's a real encouragement to engage in healthy eating and to make it possible for people to do that. Let me let me offer up uh, one more pitch for Rahima and then we'll then we'll talk about I want to get Professor Marianne Cummings to talk about uh, the Chinese charm offensive with Saudi Arabia and Iran and we'll talk about Yemen which uh, America should uh, there should be the ICC should put John Kerry on trial for Yemen, but that's a whole other issue. Uh, 
money donating, I believe, is a form of prayer. If you give to the right causes, you know, uh, in when you, when in in the Old Testament, uh, they used to sacrifice animals on the altar, and it was really to feed the, the high priests in many way, in many ways. But it was also a, a symbol, I believe, Professor Hussein, where you were saying it was an act of faith. It was saying to God, uh, I know that the earth, the, the universe is plentiful and I can sacrifice. Uh, I can burn this goat that I need to eat. But I'm, I, I'm sacrificing this as a sign to God that I know there'll be other goats that that you are bountiful. Is that a fair? Is that, is that what sacrifice the altar, the sacrifices were about to show faith in God that I can give up sources of meat because I know you'll provide me with others? Yeah, I mean, it's basically like a fertility uh, sort of rite or ritual where you are sort of putting back into the system, as it were, uh, a portion that belongs to God to, res to thank God for having provided the harvest or the bounty. And it's also, as you're pointing out, something of an insurance policy where you're, you know, paying into it, uh, you know, a premium so that next year, you know, you'll get, um, you know, the payout that you need. So it, it's definitely got that kind of transactional, creating a continuing relationship right. with the forces of prosperity and, uh, and um, you know, fecundity. Right. And the Sabbath is, uh, is saying to God, I'm not working. I have faith that the universe provides. And so in many ways, if you're, if you're donating to the right causes, it's a form of prayer. Giving five dollars to Rahima.org is a form of prayer, even if I'm not telling you to go without. But if you have five dollars and you have to choose between the proverbial anti-union Starbucks cappuccino or fe really feeding a family for five bucks, providing a meal, literally five bucks will provide a wholesome meal. Uh, I will go so far as to say it is almost sinful to not give to Rahima, to choose a cappuccino at Starbucks over Rahima.org. Uh, I maybe I'm stepping over the line, but if you don't do that, you're going to burn in hell. I guess that's <laughs> maybe it's too <laughs> hard to here, sell. Folks. <laughs> no, but seriously, it is. It, it is David a, is going to, you know, give you a real fire and brimstone <laughs> speech here. I thought I thought Bar Reverend Barry would have been on. <laughs> I wanted to get you to uh, anyway, Rahima.org. You will feel better. Five dollars, five dollars or more. But five dollars, you will you will feed a family and you will feel better. Professor Marianne Cummings, the Chinese charm offensive. We're busy. In Ukraine. What are the Chinese doing in Saudi Arabia yes. and Iran? What are, the, what are the Chinese doing all over the world? I think there are dozens of what we used to call third world countries who now have high speed rail. I don't believe the United States has one kilometer of high speed rail anywhere. Well, we're, we're Bill Amtrak. The, 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 we're helping. We're buying past something with. Something, Amtrak. something, a big privatization yeah. scheme. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, he I, I saw a little bit of uh, there was this. My God, it looked like a scene out of Lord of the Rings or something. Big round table. <laughs> Xi Jinping is on one one part of it. And equally at equal distances are was it uh, Ursula van der Leyen who is and uh, Macron. And, you know, of course, the Chinese are civilized, you know, they are going to accept and with all due respect, any world leader that comes to visit them. But, you know, the Chinese have already spelled out, you know, what, how they think things, for instance, should proceed in, um, in, in Ukraine. And 
they've been taking to lecturing people a little bit. You know, uh, we don't need to sit here and listen to you guys lecture us about human rights or anything. You know, former colonial powers. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think that these... It, this has been kind of a, a long time coming where the United States was the super sole superpower th for 30 years. And as I said repeatedly, we could have taken that dominance in the world economically and militarily and raised people up, you know, really got got behind real human rights reforms rather than just ways of overthrowing other people's governments, getting behind major global environmental reforms and agricultural reforms and a whole slew of things. We did not do that. We instead, everything we have done has exacerbated the problems. Is that to Professor the, Hussein, yeah. is the Belts and Road Initiative as charitable as we think it is on the show compared to the IMF? Well, I haven't done um, a an extremely thorough analysis and comparison. I've just read around it a little bit. Um, I think, uh, I think the austerity measures that are typically imposed under IMF structural re you know, adjustment plans when countries go into debt, uh, inevitably mean that basic services have to be cut. Government employees who provide those services are laid off and you have some disastrous consequences for development taking place. Um, social development, the social factors of development. You need education and you need health. Otherwise, the country's economy is not going to develop. And those are the first things that end up being cut in these systems and privatization schemes. So China doesn't really impose the same kind of uh, credit regime. Um, right. Of course, there's still credit if these countries can't. What, but what they like to do is what they call win-win uh, uh, trade deals, where they, China makes an investment in building infrastructure, roads, bridges, ports, uh, things that will generate e economic uh, activity and in which they can take a share uh, mm -hmm. of, of the you know, kind of proceeds and the revenues that come from things like you know, port fees and so on. Um, now, I've heard some things about how there is a bit of a debt trap. Uh, this is an allegation that's often made. Um, but in fact, actually, in some of the cases that we've seen, um, like what happened in Sri Lanka uh, recently, is that they will restructure these uh, on terms that are mutually beneficial over the long term. It's not that it isn't a kind of uh, capitalism. I mean, it is. It's some kind of capitalism. There's profits that need to be made and generated. But it seems to be one that's designed, according to the Chinese, to uh, produce favorable outcomes for both parties. And that isn't always the guiding principle for Western uh, investment that goes through World Bank and IMF where the fundamental they're loan uh, sharks basically yeah that's the, the point is that like you know they take this credit regime very very seriously and to the exclusion of the benefits to the society they're willing to sacrifice the benefits that should accrue to society through uh you know social programs education. and private and forced privatization forced privatization so that the benefits and profits uh go towards those who are holding the debt. Um, and so, you know, I, I, th I tend to think that while there may be some problems with this, and of course, China is pursuing its interest, it's not doing this purely as a charity for the rest of the world, but it is following principles that try to adhere to mutual benefit, which is, of course, actually the supposed theory of trade and exchange, even in liberal economics, you know, since Adam Smith and Daniel Ricardo, there was the idea that, you know, trade is actually supposed to be mutually beneficial. Unfortunately, over the last 50, 70, 100 years, uh, we've seen trade has often uh, not been beneficial to some parties in, in, in this. So, right. and that has uh, um, retarded development from social development from taking place. Um, so I think you know, I think China is pursuing a very interesting policy. They have established a lot of goodwill throughout the global south because of their different approach. 
It's also an approach. I had a friend who um, was a development officer and political officer in um, the European Union's kind of development arm, the European Commission. And she told me that they were getting their, you know, uh, clock cleaned, you know, by the Chinese because the Chinese come and they say, oh, you need a road, uh, you need a dam, you need a port. OK, we'll build it. And that's it. It's like they, they, they do that with the EU or with the U.S., there's all this discussion about, well, we have to first ensure legal and political reform. Because we're very concerned about your corruption. And, um, you know, they'll give them lectures on democratization and human rights. And maybe they won't even really finish the development project. But you've got to sit through kind of all of these hoops um, to prove your worthiness and change your society and change your governing structures and so on to meet the approval of these so-called democratic reforms. I'm not saying that corruption doesn't exist, but look at our system. Our system is plenty corrupt. You know, it's not as if, uh, you know, we have the standing to really at this point, you know, lecture the world about, you know, fair and honest dealing and transparency um, and, you know, accountability. Uh, so that's the reason why China has built up these very positive relationships with countries in the global south that were in, based initially just on economic foundations that were beneficial to both parties. And now we're seeing exactly what Mary, uh, Professor Marianne has just been mentioning, is that now they're turning those relationships into effective diplomatic uh, negotiations and overtures. China has made a proposal about Ukraine peace plan that was, you know, pilloried or dismissed really as unserious and wouldn't lead to anything by the United States. However, we'll see if there's right. going to be a solution. Perhaps China will be involved and the principles upon which it articulated its sort of peace orientation or, or proposal may, in fact, you know, be relevant. Secondly, they've brokered this historic relationship that's going to transform relations in the Middle East between Saudi Arabia and Iran. When it was first announced, again, commentators in the West and the United States, you know, dismissed it as, you know, probably exaggerated, might lead to nothing. Um, and yet, uh, at the time, I said it wouldn't solve any, all the problems, but it will be interesting to see if it will have positive benefits on reintegrating Syria into the Arab League. There already were rumors that Turkey had started negotiations and made proposals to Syria and that the UAE had reached out. The United Arab Emirates had reached out to Syria. Now it turns out that just last week that the Saudis have announced that they are going to invite Hafez al I mean, uh, sorry, not Hafez al-Assad, Bashar al-Assad his son, to the next Arab League meeting that they are themselves are hosting in May and that next week they will send their foreign minister to make the formal invitation. And they're clearly working towards some kind of reintegration after, you know, a decade, basically, of promoting a, you know, in, an insurgency against um, against the Assad government. And then what do we find out today uh, it was announced is that the Saudis are going forward in um, diplomatic negotiations to put an end to hostilities, a ceasefire, and negotiate some kind of political solution under the auspices of Oman and also the UN, which has been continuing to try and sponsor these negotiations, uh, for a peace plan for Yemen that would um, you know, allow the Houthis and the Saudis to resolve some kind of their, their differences. This is really amazing, and it could have really serious consequences in a realignment in the Middle East. I mean, basically, U.S. policy has been to foment hostility towards Iran and create a block of the so-called, you know, Sunni powers against the Shia crescent and to try and isolate and put sanctions on Iran and its allies, and uh, particularly Syria, and to try and neutralize, you know, Hezbollah in the south of Lebanon. That's been the basis, basically, of U.S. policy for two decades, really. Um, and we're seeing that the pillars of it, which was Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states who fund everything through their oil revenues, have decided to go in a much more independent way, looking after the interests of themselves and the region, and that the U.S. has been caught flat-footed completely. And despite 
you know, statements by Jack Kirby, I think it was Jack Kirby, uh, for a, a pres- you know, a White House uh, spokesperson about how they had been read in on all of these developments taking right. place between Saudi and Iran. The CIA chief, William Burns, made an unannounced sudden trip to Saudi Arabia and complained about you know, uh, being frustrated by these developments and being that the CIA was caught blindsided. Now, this is back channel William Burns. OK, this is the man whose <laughs> autobiography is about the back channels and how he's this diplomatic fixer. You don't know what's happening. You know, there, you read the news, but there's a back channel. and right. He knows what's really going on. And he's operating behind the scenes, making deals, making things happen, you know, and here he is admitting to being caught flat footed. Well, and um, let me, let me know. ask you about that. Let me, let me ask Professor Marianne. Well, they're stuck in a world of the 1990s. But let me, let, 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 me, yeah. bef- let me ask this question, because mm-hmm. from my understanding of American foreign policy is it's it's top down and it's usually the president working with one other guy and they're making all the decisions and everybody else is left flat footed. So is it conceivable that Blinken and our friends from West Exec, who are running Biden's foreign policy, uh, are saying, you know what, let the world fix itself. Let's restore the post-World War II global order. Let's build up the U.N., and these alliances and empower other countries to take the load off America. Is it conceivable that Biden is saying, am I giving him way too much credit where he's saying, why, why, why do we have to negotiate a peace between Saudi Arabia and Iran? Let somebody else do this. Is that conceivable that? Think they're saying are, are you being serious? David? Yes, I am. I'm, Sounds like a Saturday Night Live sketch. Is it conceivable <laughs> that Biden would say we? You I don't know, think it's conceivable that Biden says anything coherent about or or, or Anthony Blinken. Would you or agree Anthony that Blinken, Blinken is is making the decisions in terms of foreign policy? I don't think they're making. They're they're now in a situation of largely reacting. They've made their decisions. They decided to you know basically sabotage any efforts toward real uh, reconciliation and diplomacy with regards to Russia and Ukraine, for instance, for the previous eight years and within the last one. That's now just out in the open. Um, uh, I mean, you want but there's to no the virtue to a president with a hands off uh, saying hands off for some of these countries. Let them. But, but they're not doing it. We're bombing. We're still bombing about a dozen countries right now as we speak. I, I know we're that. But I'm saying like off. with but what I'm saying is like if Oman can negotiate some kind of settlement uh, with Saudi Arabia and Yemen, is it conceivable that Anthony Blinken is saying better? You know, it's probably a better idea, given our history and the mistrust that we have and our alliance with Israel. Oman, maybe Turkey, maybe we're not the ones to do the shuttle diplomacy. Is it conceivable that Blinken is thinking of that? No. Uh, (laughs) Short answer. Uh, Second answer is, you know, you're assuming that basically, um, you know, we were all about bringing peace and democracy and stability to the world. Well, a stability, yes, but even Schlesinger admitted back in the 1950s, and he was considered the dove in the State Department that, you know, no, this isn't about this isn't about democracy. This is basically about our control. You know, there are two big powers that are running the world right now. That was back in the Cold War days. No, I, there, there is nothing. I mean, we know Ben Norton wrote a very good article about this a little over a year ago, you know, that we know what the philosophy of the people who are now in the State Department. I mean, they are Dick Cheney's minions. They are the neocons that have gone one better than Henry Kissinger. They're the ones that think that China and and Russia have to be dismantled as countries. And they really believe that. And they thought that that they would be able to do it with war, with pushing Russia into a war with Ukraine. 
you know, provoke, provoking Russia into a war, basically a proxy war with NATO. Right. And uh, it's, I, I don't know why they thought they would be able to succeed were the Swedes and Napoleon and Hitler's panzer forces, you know, failed, but that yeah, they did. I mean, they really did. And I think partly is that, you know, the old saying, he who wins at a rigged game gets stupid. I mean, we did have economic and military dominance. And so why go into the weeds trying to, quote, understand the real needs of other countries when we can just go in there and right. dictate terms to them? Okay. And that's what the rest of the world is no longer accepting. And, uh, you know, I think uh, uh, Kamala Harris's charm offensive, her trip to Africa uh, a week ago kind of showed that. I mean, you had the leader of the Socialist Party in Zambia just tell her to, uh, you know, we don't need to be lectured by a country that has systematically killed some of our best leaders. Really? <laughs> 30 or 40 years. Oh, yeah, it's all Asian. It's it's on YouTube. The uh, I think it was the president or the prime minister of Ghana made some similar point pointed remarks like you are going to lecture us about democracy, you know, who have right. toppled so many governments here and this and that and, you know, and so on and so forth. I think it is. I think it's genuinely taking these guys by surprise. How is William Burns, for instance, surprised? I mean, William Burns, if you read stuff he wrote about the NATO expansion just 10, 12 years ago, it sounds imminently reasonable. Right. Now, maybe he's just, you know, he's got to get with the people he's with, but maybe he they are... Look, people are surprised. The Soviet Union seemed, you know, like forever, right? That seemed like that was a country that a power that was going to was never going to fail. And it fought, it fell. And it was startling to Pappy Bush when it fell. I mean, I think they were very upset because, you know, the Soviet Union crumbling would mean that the world is not, you know, managed by two big powers suddenly right. there's a lot of leeway and a lot of talk about democracy and peace dividend and all this nonsense that had to be stopped but um okay. yeah i think that's what's happening to people right now these people i think are genuinely stunned all right that, to be continued let me yeah. give each of you your last thoughts uh what uh well, anything you would like to end on, Professor Hussein? Well, just on that point to say that um, there have been a bunch of developments that have been taking place. Peace is threatening to break out. And the United States seems to be quite disturbed uh, by the prospects of that. Mm -hmm. um, in Yemen, which we haven't talked about the details too much, but... But please, uh, please, it's the most oh, important... Oh, no, there's not so much to say other than that already there's been changes to um, the kind of blockade that the Saudis have put on economically on Yemen. And so there's uh, imports are coming in on a whole variety of things like fertilizers, like batteries that are needed to get the agricultural sector back up and going. Um but also that there's thought that um, with the negotiations, they might reach an agreement and be able to announce it um, on the Eid at the end of the, the Ramadan and have mm. good news uh, for the region by April 20th. That's the, that's the hope. So there's a lot of developments that are taking place, none of which seem to be involving the U.S. being you know, engaged or sponsoring them. So on your point about whether this is intended or not, um, one could be agnostic, although I'm a little bit skeptical. I think they're reeling and reacting and um, just not uh, involved. But what it shows is when the U.S. gets out of the way, some progress might start to happen. Right. <laughs> so it's a good thing. I fully uh, endorse uh, President Joe Biden's withdrawal from Afghanistan. He took a lot of flack yes. for that. I gave him credit for making that decision and sticking to it. Yes. Um, and in this case, I would really be uh, delighted if he would accept these new regional uh, changes and not try and reverse them. So if this is his policy to have a hands off approach, uh, good things are happening from the U.S. pulling back from its involvement and in attempt to extend its control 
uh, you know, over over the region. Um, so it's very hopeful, uh, good, hopeful signs. Good, good. Professor Marianne, you get the last word. Yeah, I just wanted to make a little note about the election. The other election in Illinois, there were elections all over the state, but the one in my town, Aurora, John Lash won decisively for Alderman at large. Suddenly, the press is going to start showing up to uh, city council meetings because it's going to be a lot more interesting going forward. Um, he, he now, but there. we should point out that Aurora is the second largest city in, in Illinois, Illinois, and John Lash ran for mayor. Yeah. Uh, he ran for mayor two years ago and lost. I have a feeling if that race had been run this time around, the results would be a lot different. But nonetheless, he's alderman at large, which means he will be the one quoted. <laughs> I mean, he will be the one speaking out at all the city council meetings and the ones that the press is going to be paying attention to. And it's going to be a very interesting. But the way he did it was more most important. He got together people to run with him, people who had never run before. And yes, some of them lost. But John was quick to point out if we hadn't all been campaigning together, John may not have won and certainly not by the margin he did. And one of the things that is going to go forward from the from the fundraising ideas is something like called tacos and taillights. What was that? It was a fundraising event. But if you needed your taillight fixed, show up. And they we had a bunch of mechanics. They fixed people's taillights and we served everybody. That tacos. is what Henry, the great Henry Huckamacki talked about. Henry said something about that, about how the right wing, the, the religious communities, as yes. problematic as they are, they take care of people and that the Democrats need to take care of people. Tell me about tacos and taillights. What is so this? It was just Don't gloss. So this is really important. This was. Yeah. And we were we were running it for David Cannon, who ran in the fifth district now. If David had run in any district, he got more votes than the winners of like four other uh, wards, like half the wards run this year and the, the other half run two years from now. And explain this, why tacos, explain why tacos and taillights is so because important. Because you bring community, you bring people together. You First of all, that was a very well run event. If somebody can like organize this event where you can get all of his friends who couldn't really give him campaign contributions, but they were mechanics. But what, we got a but, boatload of different kind of taillights. And if you had a lot of people have little things like broken taillights and in this community, that's what the cops. Believe. Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, so that was relevant. So there were just a ton of people showed up. And then it was just a big social events, rice and beans. And it was probably, you know, basically uh, 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 Professor Adnan's food. But, you know, it was just uh, it was just a, a basic Mexican food and people could sit down and you could contribute if you wanted to Dave's campaign. But you could also sign up and distribute, go to door to door. That was also a contribution you could make. I, what are the laws? I, I it's an unfair question, but mm -hmm. the money that gets wasted when you donate to Nancy and Joe and Kamala, that if you had tacos and t the Democrats would win by a landslide. I don't know if it's legal to spend that money on fixing. Maybe it's buying votes. I don't know if it's is it legal. Well, you know, campaign country and you. People have big lavish events and oh, get your picture taken with Hillary right. or you know, the the mayor or the governor, you know. And so this is like considered perfectly normal that people lavish all this money here. It's just a bunch of people deciding they're going to have an event and and feature somebody running for office at this event. But. You know, this this guy, I don't think he collect. I don't think David K collected any money from that event directly. He just talked about his campaign. And if you want to donate, here's the website. If you want to, you know, here's here's every weekend we meet at John Lash's house and get a walk list. You know, and uh, 
But basically, it was just a, a, a really wonderful community event. And that the fact that it came together so easily um, and people felt like they could really do something, you know, people who can't afford to give money, you can afford to fix, you can, if, I mean, I can imagine me doing a bunch of handiwork and there's a, there's an event coming up in two weeks from now. I can do some carpentry. I can do some. Dentists work. could, you know, dental hygienists could come out and nurse practitioners. You know, it, 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 I have to say this one thing about the the most popular aspect of the Affordable Care Act, which I mostly loathe because it's just a shakedown racket. But the one and it was the one thing that that uh, Bernie Sanders insisted on was the community right. clinics. Even Republican governors like that they get into you know they get into poor and underserved areas. And people get their teeth looked at for the first time. And people get their blood check, pressure checked. People just get simple health care. Um, so, you know, that I think the Democratic Party, when they made a decision to move away, from, well, they made a decision to break with the poor after Ronald Reagan, but they, even before that, but they made a decision to just turn on the middle, uh, the working class back away and just go to the clean money, you know, the banks. (laughs) And so uh, I think that this is how you reconnect. And yeah, you're very, you're very much right. People, when people feel like there's nobody solving their problems and somebody comes along, who is just like my, my landlady said years and years ago when she was a young lady and first moved into Chicago, didn't know anybody like in this big city, no friends, it's a knock on the door. It's the war. It's the precinct captain. It's a lady who was basically the precinct captain for the entire tenement. She just introduced herself. She says, what do you need if you're in trouble? If you get Can I change a light bulb for you or, you know, if you need something, if your plumbing breaks, you say, you just go see me. Right. And she said, I love this lady. It just suddenly you felt like you had a family. Right. And, and you had people who would help you. Right, right. And she didn't even ask her for money or anything else. She just introduced her source, herself as the, uh, I think it was the precinct committee captain. And um, you anyway. Sh- you strip the Democratic Party of these Ivy League. Pro- yeah, I was just going to say, like, you know, the PMC that has taken over. Professional the- managerial the- class. Right. Yeah. Professional managerial class, which want you to fill out a whole host of forms and then means test you for your taillight. Uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know? So, I right. really love what this. What was your idea. pre-tax income last year? Right. <laughs> yeah. I, I, that is, you know, it, uh, very hopeful. Spring is here and I know the world is falling apart, but if you focus on just the winter, uh, you miss the tulip bulb sprouting. Who's on the, uh, who is on the Mudgeless podcast and who is on Guerrilla History? Well, on Guerrilla History, we have an episode that just came out today that is a discussion Henry and I had about uh, Franz Fanon and this documentary uh, about anti-colonial resistance. Uh, so do check it out. Um, we've got stuff coming out uh, all the time. And on the Mudge list, we've had a bit of a hiatus, but we did have um, uh, our last our last uh, uh, episode was really about the Kafala system um, because of all the attention on uh, um, Qatar World Cup. And I have to say one point I'd wanted to make on the previous discussion about changes that are taking place in the Middle East, I suspected in a way when you had thousands and thousands of Iranian fans showing up to Qatar and mixing with thousands and thousands of Saudi fans, it was really a regional sort of experience that something might come out of this, you know, this kind of experience of uh, pride in the region and a little bit more contacts and things happening. I don't know if it played a role, but I had this feeling myself that this could be a turning point in the region to create some lines of dialogue that, uh, you know, people have been fragmented and split in the geopolitics of, of, of the region in the kind of new cold war of the Shia, you know, Sunni so-called split. And, um, 
I think, you know, there, it's, it's just fascinating to see. So at any rate, you can find out a little bit more about this whole labor, the history of this kind of labor regime uh, and its sources and origins. I talked with a graduate student here, but we should have some new episodes um, uh, coming up soon. So do stay tuned. Uh, fantastic. All of the much list. One of our best. Uh, this is fantastic. One of our best ever. Thank you, Professor Marianne Cummings. Follow her on Twitter at Razor Girl. Follow Professor Adnan Hussein on Twitter at Adnan A. Hussein. And uh, I can't thank you enough. Thank you.